so ridiculous just to be able to see what God is going to do with you too. I feel like this is the year of the open door, that God is opening up something that you haven't seen before. And it's kind of like when you go to the river and you put your toe in at the beginning. That's kind of what I'm seeing. It's like just stepping in to something that is so much deeper, so much stronger, going so much faster than you even realize until you get in the center of it. But it's just the stepping in point. And I just think God is just going to take it where he wants it to go. In worship, I actually saw a picture of two paths. One went off to the right and one went off to the left. And as we were praying in the spirit, I saw both paths come together and, and God just taking things straight. So he said, it's not going one direction or the other. It's going to go right where he wants it. Ooh, come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You guys have anything? Congratulations, Jeremy and Miranda. It's awesome to be here. I feel like God is saying that the, the, the last three years is just a scratching of the surface. There will be more and deeper on the things that God is going to show you. And God has called you and empowering you for the next move of God. God bless you, brother. Amen. Sister. Come on, let's stretch our hands towards them again. Lord, more. <laughs> more. <laughs> Come on, you Presbyterians. Yeah, there you go. Come on, this is a family effort. <laughs> yeah, Lord, they won't grow weary and well-doing. Lord, thank you, reaping, reaping, reaping. The plowman overtaking the reaper, Lord God. Lord, they've given, they've given. Lord, the fire, the glory, love. Lord God, instruction, Lord God. Oh, how they've cared. Lord God, we bless them. We bless them with health and wholeness and youth, Lord God. <laughs> yeah, not Miranda, though. She's got plenty of that. Let's... <laughs> More. <laughs> Woo. More wine, Lord God. Mas poder, mas presencia, <laughs> mas gozo, Espíritu Santo, <laughs> sano, sano, sano. <laughs> come on, we're going to invite Bishop Sharona to come. Thank you, sir. Now, I don't want to get you to stop laughing, but I'm going to give you a sobering word. You all got the good words. Now the old man's going to give you the sobering word. I sense that the open door is a physical one. That the greatest challenge to enlarge and steward what you're doing requires a location that's permanent. The greatest battle you will face is being landed. There is something about landedness biblically that sets and establishes something in the earth. It's one thing to have friends open the doors. It's another thing to have the key to open your own door. Come on. And so I'm going to just share with you from perspective of being an old man that's been around for a little while. Don't feel like I'm old, but I am old. Get your key leaders together and all your companions. Set aside a season, an extended season, three days, five days, to seek the face of God from this perspective. The building exists. It's waiting for you. You haven't seen it yet, but it's there. So the premise from which you're going to pray is that it's already been prepared and it's already waiting for your arrival. That's number one. Number two, that God would put in place all that is necessary for a deal to be legislated without complication and with acceleration. And number three, this is already a given. The provision is already there. The provision isn't the issue. 
the issue is tied the greatest battles are land battles whether it's Jericho or whether it's Mount Zion at Jericho it was the walled city that was impenetrable at Zion it was that the Jebusites had faked the idea that they were more powerful because they had a very thin defense and David got an insight that if they climbed up through the water ducts they would tear down the thin facade I don't think you're about to face a Jericho I think you're about to face a citadel a Zion and the and the Jebusites would like to say you can't come in here but by the waterway you're going to get behind the facade of the citadel that will become the base operation for what you're doing. So the battle isn't going to be what you think it is. The battle is going to be the false intimidation. But just remember when that comes, say, God, show me where the water ducks are. And your leaders are going to run ahead of you and scout it out. And God's going to cause his goodness to be seen in the land of the living. Wow, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we receive all of that. We just, can we give Jesus a big hand, you guys? I mean, huh. I got a whole bunch of stuff I was going to say. I'm not going to say it anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually just going to invite Bishop up to speak tonight. And listen, it's an honor to have uh, Bishop Mark Sharona with us from Church on the Living Edge in Orlando, Florida. And Miranda and I just, uh, we just totally love, uh, you know, Bishop and, and just all the encouragement he's given us, so, even over the years. And, and I, I can't even talk. Just come on. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to encourage all of you to be in prayer for a building. Um, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to make a big deal about things. I just have been around the block, and any pastor worth their weight in salt knows that the biggest battle is always over a building. The biggest battle over, over spearheading anything is tied to being landed. There's something about putting roots down on property that is yours, that um, comes with challenges. And zoning rights are part of what the church faces in North America in ways that 50 years ago would have never been an issue. And, um, but earnest prayer and effectual prayer makes a difference. You know, not far from here, Papa Cerullo has just built a multi-million dollar center for what's happened so far in the move of God. And he's, Papa's 88 years old. And um, I've gotten, I've had the privilege of being with Morris on many occasions. I count him a precious general and a dear friend. And, uh, and he's not afraid of warfare. I don't know you're not either. But if Brother Cerullo in his 80s can do something new, and, and somehow we gotta, 
We're going to work it out for you and Brother Cerullo to get together so he can chat with you and then maybe even lay hands on you. Just catch a little bit of his patriarchal blessing. But um, in a minute, I'm going to open the scripture that I was going to open this afternoon that I didn't open. Um, I did bring some resources. There's more back there, but I, I do want to at least talk about them because my staff says I never talk about what I bring. Um, but I'll talk about it real quick. This series, The Return of Elijah, The Return of the Rain, is one of the newest series I've done on Elijah and the Rain. The key to this series is understanding that Elijah is important for the rain because the rain begins in him. The heavens don't open until Elijah returns. So there's something about him coming back that's tied to an understanding of what God's looking for in us. And, and, I, and, and I do tell you who the servant is, but it isn't Gehazi. He was with Elisha. He wasn't even born yet. Um, <laughs> but, but that's the secret at the end of it. But it's, it's really a powerful series. It's already gone all over the world. This is one of my most recent series on faith. It's called The Pioneer of the Listening Ear. It's about Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and how he develops our ability to listen. You've heard it said faith comes by hearing based on Romans 10, but that word hearing actually implies an ability to listen well. And it's not listening to a Bible text. It's listening to a Bible story. World of difference. It's not a text, a, a verse that brings faith. It's the narrative about Jesus. We often misinterpret Romans 10, take it totally out of context and build a doctrine out of it that isn't even faithful to what it's all about. And there was silence in San Diego for the space of a half hour. <laughs> For, I'm going to show you what we do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Wrong. It's not what it says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. See, you hear it. Let's just, mag let's just imagine this was a Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Bible. That's how you hear it because that's how you've been taught by American evangelists. It's inaccurate. Faith doesn't come by hearing the Bible. Faith comes by hearing the story of Christ because he manifests himself in the telling of the story so that the event of preaching is an event because Christ comes in the telling of his story. And faith comes because he comes. We've been asking him to come for the last... Season of worship, right? So when the text is preached and the story is told, the purpose of worship is to prepare us to listen to the one who comes in the telling of the story that's him. He's the pioneer and perfecter of your listening ear. And we live in a culture that's easily distracted. And so there's a reason that less happens instead of more. It's because we're selective in our listening. And we're looking for our favorite text, which is often taken out of context, and not listening to the story in a faithful way. And so Jesus, the human, the divine human one, had to learn obedience himself so that he could teach us how to listen. Because God gave him the ear of a disciplined one. Isaiah says... You've given me the ear of a disciple and the tongue of the learned. So he's the pioneer of the listening ear because he lived it for you to show you how it's to work. But anyway, I promise it'll bless you. And then this series is called The Battle Between True and False Prophecy. Don't get this one if you want to stay in any level of illusion about who Jezebel is. The American evangelical and charismatic movement has turned Jezebel into something the Bible knows nothing about. We are unfaithful in what we say about Jezebel 
because we don't trust the story. The battle between true and false prophecy begins in Genesis 3, verse 15, with the first messianic promise based on the fact that Satan said, has God said. So there's two competing narratives that begin with has God said. God says and Satan says, has God said. That's where true and false prophecy begin. And you have to chase the rabbit all the way through scripture to find out how that plays out. And when you get to the story of Ahab and Jezebel and Naboth's vineyard and why that story is so key to false prophecy, you discover that what we've done to Jezebel is we've demonized women that are strong in the name of we don't want them to be in power. And so in the charismatic church, that's the woman that wants to head up the prayer meeting. In the Pentecostal church, it's the one that wants to tell the deacons what to do. Now listen, there are strong-willed men just like there are strong-willed women. But when we label women as Jezebel in the name of God gave us a word or politicians as Jezebel and claim biblical authority, you are on dangerous ground. Shut up. You got, now you got the old prophet. You got the crotchety old prophet just now. I am so sick of prophets prophelying about women they think are Jezebels. We've, it's bad enough that women have gotten a bum rap in the church and they're marginalized. And so to demonize any woman that happens to be strong has nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with a compromise of the text. Jezebel has to do with land rights. Because it's all about Naboth's vineyard. Haven't got time, but I promise it'll be very enlightening. And none of you will prophesy about Jezebel anymore after that unless you want to fry. And you want to fry, and just don't listen to this because you'll be held accountable once you hear what Sharona has to say. This is my latest book, Dead Prophet Society. <laughs> the transcript was completed in 2015. Someone has recently made, made the statement that I, he, he helped me write this when I wanted to say we never talked about this in 2015. I did this series, got it to the editor just this last year, but in 2015 I did a series. We transcribed it. My editor edited it, but we just released it this year. But Dead Prophet Society was based on the beginning of the story of Robin Williams and Dead Poet Society when he praised Professor John Keating in an all-boys school that he attended. And while he had attended the school himself, they started a secret society called the Dead Poet Society. And his desire was to motivate and inspire these young men to get in touch with a former generation and not forget history and realize that locked up in graves were poets that still had something to say the way they were dead. And oftentimes they said things prophetically, poetically, that they never got to see come to pass. And so he gets them to stand on their desks and he points to all the dead poets in the room and he says, see boys, these men are all pushing up daisies. He says, but seize the day. And he begins to look at one, Walt Whitman, and talks about his greatest poem, O Captain, My Captain, which is about Abraham Lincoln. And Whitman never got to see the realization of what he wrote, and Lincoln never got to hear the poem. He was eulogized before he died, but neither got to see the outcome. And he was actually quite prophetic in his poem. You do a careful study of scripture, and the, the prophets were poets. Because poetically, you can say far more than you can writing prose because of the way you turn phrases. Stay with me. And so 
the dead prophet society is about the fact that if we don't honor the dead prophets and we think simply because we can prophesy that we know what we're doing we will miss the whole purpose of the prophetic and the story begins in the book with no fanfare it says Elisha died of the sickness that he died from and they buried him in a common grave an open grave he'd had no fanfare no big funeral he was marginalized and they buried him in a common grave that was open and in those days if you were poor you got thrown in a common grave and there was no seal over the cave or over the tomb and you were thrown in with whoever else was poor that's just the first hint about who we're called to identify with and because the cave was open animals could go in and eat the rotting flesh and so if the cave was open the flesh disappeared a lot sooner than it did if the cave was closed and um, scholars estimate it was about a year and a half period of time by the time Elisha was nothing but bones and by the time he died everything he prophesied about the enemy coming in from Syria and wreaking havoc has happened and the raid raiding bands of the Moabites have come in to steal seed before harvest so that Israel can't make any advances and two men are trying to honor the death of a young man who died before his time that we have no idea what his name was and they see the marauding bands of the Moabites and rather than stand and defend the memory of their young friend they toss him self-preservation kicks in and they just toss the dead body he's not worth much But they toss him into an open grave, not knowing the open grave they toss him into is the grave where a man had died and had no successor. And so there still remains something in his bones that testified that though he was dead, the power was still there. And when that unnamed young man who died before his time and never fulfilled his destiny touched the bones of a dead prophet he was revived stood back on his stood that means resurrected back on his feet to fulfill what he couldn't fulfill because he died before his time that's the beginning of the dead prophet society and then I take us on to understand what's the real role of prophetic function because it's more than reading your mail and so Jeremy, those are for you. And for Miranda. And, and if Miranda will um, let you eat a filet mignon steak in front of her, I'll give you a few more. <laughs> Miranda's a vegan. My wife is a vegan. I'm Italian. We just, we need the grease. Uh, you eat that, it'll kill you. Oh, but what a way to go. My wife will say, you're not going to be healthy, you eat that. I say, my Uncle Danny, I told you about him today, but my Uncle Danny said, I've seen more old drunks than old doctors. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> I want you to look with me in Mark 8. Mark 8. I'm going to read from first the New American Standard, and then I'm going to read from... Kenneth Wiest's expanded translation from the Greek. 
Mark 8, 22 in the New American Standard. Now it reads a little, you know, New American Standard is a very technical translation, but it's very accurate, but it, 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 it's technical. So it's not as flowing as the New Living Translation or as um, the New Revised Translation. It's not as poetic as the King James, but it's very accurate. So listen carefully. And they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village and after spitting on his eyes and laying hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Now let me read it to you from Kenneth Weiss' expanded translation. And he will give you the verb tenses in the Greek. So now it's going to read even rougher, but you'll get a feel for how the Greek verb tenses are. And they come into Bethsaida. So this is if it's, as if it's happening in the present, even though it's not the present. And they come into Bethsaida. He's putting you into the story in the Greek. And they bring him a blind man. So there's two groups of they. There's they that come to Bethsaida and they that bring to Jesus and they a blind man and they beg him to touch him and having taken the hand of the blind man he brought him outside the village and having spit upon his eyes having placed his hands upon him he kept on asking him do you possibly see anything? And having looked up, notice the end havings, end havings. This is a tense in the Greek, and the nuance is important. And having looked up, he kept on saying, I see the men as trees. I see them walking around. I see the men as trees. I see them walking around. I see the men as trees. So he's scanning, and then he's looking up to Jesus and repeating, I see the men as trees walking around. I see the men as trees walking around. I, 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 you get it? Really important. And so verse 25, it says, Then again he, that is Jesus, placed his hands upon his eyes. And he looked steadfastly, and he was restored to his former state. And he was seeing all things at a distance and clearly. And he sent him off to his home saying, do not even go into the town. And we will trust Father to add his blessing to the public reading of his word. This particular story of the healing of the blind man, when we generally hear it, we turn it into a story that Jesus had to touch him twice because the power wasn't enough. And we, we, we end up thinking, wow, that's a revelation. Here's the revelation. That's not what it's talking about <laughs> at all. If that's what you think it's saying, you need to go back and read the story. Because a text out of context is a pretext for a proof text. What that means is that you're not reading it in context and you're making it say something that it isn't saying and then you're unfaithful in what you're communicating to people claiming you got a revelation. When in actual fact, you weren't even paying attention to the story. And so, and you'll get after a while, if you know Sharona, you know I'm a real stickler for what the text really says. And uh, so I don't pull any punches when it comes to that because I've been around the block a few times. I've heard the best and the worst in 45 years of preaching. And at this season of my life, um, I want to hear faithful speech from the text about what Jesus is up to because that's where we're going to see the miracles. 
And so this particular miracle, this sign takes place after Jesus has fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. And in the process of feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000, Mark tells us that Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they start arguing about they had no bread for the journey because they're in the boat heading to Dalmanutha and they've got no bread for the journey. And Jesus says, having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, don't you hear? Having hearts, have you become dull and insensible? I'm not talking about the bread that you just had. I'm talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You not only missed that, you missed who I am because I am the bread. And he tells them their hearts had become hard. Next thing you know, they show up in Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida was a fishing town. The name of the town Bethsaida means house of fishing or house of snares. In other words, to catch a fish, you got to bait it. You got to set a trap. You got to set a lure. So Bethsaida is called the house of snares or the house of um, of of bait. It it, it, it literally means to set a trap to catch fish. So it's in some ways you could make the argument that this is about being ensnared or entrapped. And when Jesus and the disciples get to Bethsaida, which was, by the way, the hometown of Philip, right? When he gets there, a group of people, knowing he arrives, bring a blind man to him. Now, we're told in the story that the blind man's eyes were restored, which means he at once could see and had lost his vision. We got it? So this is not a miracle of someone who never saw. This is someone who saw and then lost his vision. Okay, and in the process, in the Greek, the word blepo, which means to see, is used three different ways. Look up, look out, look into. One is a penetrating graze, which you don't get to until the very end of the story. And so what you want to understand is that there are three different dynamics taking place within the man that are tied to the hardness of heart of the disciples who were seeing miracles but kept misunderstanding in their hearts what they were pointing to. That's a Bill Johnson nod. And Bill usually does that when it gets really quiet. And he says, I think I'm going to talk to the screen over there. And he says the same thing to the wall or to the screen, right? So so here's here's this man who has lost his vision. I want you to think about this for a moment because we're going to pray in just a little while. And God's going to heal some unfinished business in people in this room. The distance between the heart and the head is only 18 inches. But it can be an impossible chasm to span when we don't understand what our hearts are wrestling with because we've analyzed the situation to death and don't realize what's deeply hidden in the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but within the heart, are all the issues of life. And so when somebody says to you, when they say something, there's no mistake in communication. When somebody says, I didn't really mean that, you can say, lie. (laughs) You you really did mean it. Oh, no, 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 that wasn't in my heart. No, that's exactly what was in your heart. There's no mistake in your communication. The mistake is you don't like the outcome you got, and so you're trying to back off and retract. Because your heart is always going to interrupt your head, and there's going to be a leak of your unfinished business. I don't know if I'm talking to the right people tonight. If, if I were home, I'd be even more personal because they're my people. You know, I, I meddle with my sheep. You know, they're... They know the sound of their shepherd's voice, and I meddle. So I, 
<laughs> but there are sometimes things slip in your conversation because out of the abundance of your heart, stuff leaks that you didn't want to get out. You say, well, it wasn't in my heart. Oh, yeah, it was. Because there are no mistakes in communication, only in the outcomes we get from the communication. And so there's this awareness that in the scripture, the heart is the seat of life. The heart is this place that is the animating center of our want to's. See, we've all got want to's. The challenge is we have want to's, but we don't always have how to's. See, and if you don't have a how to, you don't get a chance to. Because a want to without a how to guarantees you won't have a chance to. A compelling, powerful pull to the future requires seeing it before it arrives. To not have a powerful pull of the future is to not see where you're going. And if you can't see where you're going, you can't navigate anywhere because you're goalless. So even if you have a want to, if you don't have a how to, the longer you don't have a how to and the longer you delay getting a chance to, the more your want to gets buried deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until you lose your ability to even see at a distance. And you start living in survival mode just getting through the day. Can I keep going? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah tells us that Yahweh declares the end from the beginning, which means that Jesus is already in the future, calling us from the future to the future. Jesus is not calling us from where we've been. He's calling us from where we've never been that he's already arrived at. Our horizon is him. He is calling us from the future to the future, and he calls those things that are not as though they are. So if I am going to walk with him, I have to learn how to see ahead of time what isn't present in my current reality. But life has a way of ensnaring us. And we can have vision and think, if I just go to Bethsaida, which was a very successful fishing port, an organized city village where the fishing was good, provided opportunity. It was a place where you could make a living. It was a place where good stuff happened if you wanted it to. It was a place where Everybody that went there seemed to do well. But one day, 
A young man went hoping, well, if it happened for them, it can happen for me. But it didn't happen for him like it happened for everybody else. And what he didn't expect was that something touched his life that caused him to literally lose his sight. Psychologists will tell you that when a person loses their sight, they go through stages of trauma. And when the trauma hits, the first thing they deal with is denial. This didn't really happen. I'm going to see again. And it doesn't happen. And now, something else happens. Grief sets in. And when grief sets in, they start withdrawing. Why? Because they don't feel like they fit in anymore. See, because once you lose your vision, everybody else who has theirs is different than you. And you think now you're different from them. What you don't realize is you still have your want to. But that doesn't matter anymore because you don't have a how to or a chance to. Can I keep going? You good? I'm not, I, I'm, thank you. I'm talking to her right here. Good to see you too. Um, and so... Something else happens to a person when they lose their vision. They go to a dark place, literally, where they think they're not the same person anymore. So they don't just lose their vision, they lose their identity. They don't know who they are. See, because we're called to see face to face. Why? Because Jeremy is a mirror for Mark. I can't know myself by myself. Do you remember when God makes man and woman? He says to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so God makes the woman from his rib and now, Adam knows who he is because he's face to face with someone who can mirror back what a human being is. Wow. And so Gregory Bateson, the famed American anthropologist who was married to Margaret Mead, who wasn't a believer, but he did say this, which is just a paraphrase of what God says in the text in Genesis chapter 2. Bateson said this in 1958, it takes two to know one. You cannot know yourself by yourself. You can only know yourself in relationship to others. So that when you lose your vision, you lose your ability to see a mirror of who you are. And you retreat into a dark place. And then you isolate and withdraw even more. Hallelujah. And now you forget what you look like. And you don't just forget what you look like, you forget what other people look like. Now, somewhere inside, the want to is still there. But the how to? I used to be able to see the road. I can't even see the road anymore. And if I'm, if I'm blind long enough, I don't even know what my relatives look like anymore. So that when I do see them, 
the best thing I can say is that they look like trees. How distant have I become from who I am when I lose my vision that the best I can remember is what trees look like, which is not what humans look like. And they look like they're walking around. But the thing is, they're in groves. Because trees rarely grow alone. Trees are always in groves. And so if I look around and I see people like trees, I'm revealing something about where I am. I'm seeing people like trees, which means I forgot what people look like. And number two, I'm seeing how isolated I really am from where life is moving. Because I'm all alone and they're all moving together. I don't belong. Can I keep going? I've got your attention. More importantly, does the Lord have your attention? See, because it is in the preaching of the gospel story that Christ manifests. God's going to give a number of people in this room tonight their vision back. I'm not just giving you a little story. I'm serving the king by unveiling a word I believe is for you on the 776 night of a three-year-long revival now where the first person God wants to revive is you. Can't give what you don't have. Amen. You can't give what you don't have. You can't have what you haven't done. You can't do what you haven't been. You can't be what you haven't believed. You can't believe what you haven't received. You can't receive what you haven't been given. Therefore, you can't give what you don't have. You want that again? <laughs> can't give what you don't have. Can't have what you haven't done. Can't do what you haven't been. Because you're a human being, not a human doing, but human beings that know who they are know what they can do. I can't give what I don't have. I can't have what I haven't done. I can't do what I haven't been. I can't be what I haven't believed. I can't believe what I haven't received. And I can't receive what I haven't been given. Therefore, I can't give what I don't have. Want it again? <laughs> Miranda's saying yes, so I'll do it. One more time for the vegan. I cannot give what I do not have. I cannot have what I have not done. I cannot do what I have not been. I cannot be what I have not believed. I cannot believe what I have not received. I cannot receive what I have not been given. Therefore, I can't give what I don't have. And the cycle keeps repeating itself. And Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Which means I've got to receive freely, but I can't receive freely if something in me repels the gift when it's given. Look at somebody and say, he's meddling. He's meddling. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Watch this. He's dealing with disciples that can't see who he is. They've got vision, but they can't see. And he gets to Bethsaida, the house of snares. And somebody that once was able to see and thought they had all the opportunity in the world, in the very place they thought they could make it, lost it. I wonder if there's anybody in the room tonight that thought, if I get there, it's all going to happen for me. And you got there. And it worked for everybody else but you. And you gradually started losing your how-to and your chance to, and you decided to bury your want to because you don't know how to manage a delayed expectation. 
You know, and when you bury it deep enough, you don't even know it's there anymore. When Gabriel appears to Zacharias, King James says he was well stricken in age. He had already given up. Don't be too hard on him. And Gabriel says, the Lord has heard your prayer. Zacharias didn't have a clue that it was tied to the fact that he wanted his wife to have a child. It was so far beyond the time when that could have happened that it wasn't even on his radar. He buried it so deep in his heart that what came out unexpectedly was unbelief. How can be. It's a different how can this be than what Mary said. It's a how can this be. You know what? If this is God, why didn't it happen when it was supposed to happen? You expect me to believe that now that it's too late? See, 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 see something in his heart was hiding until light triggered his unfinished business. He had to bring that to speech. He had no choice. In the Word of Faith movement, we were taught, don't say anything negative because you'll mess up your miracle. What refined legalism is that? That comes from the pit of hell. You lie, you fry. The last thing you want to do is deny what you have buried that's hurting you. For fear that you're going to say something that's going to mess up your miracle. This is not Christian science. We are not Gnostic heretics. We are followers and lovers of Jesus who knows exactly what's going on in our heart and would prefer you tell the truth than deny it in his presence because he is the truth and he knows it anyway and all things are naked and bare. Why are you afraid to admit, I don't believe this can happen for me? And it's the reason we've got so many people that are bitter in the body of Christ because we manipulated them with a false teaching. Jesus does not endorse Mary Baker Eddy's doctrine. But hyper-faith preachers have fed us a Gnostic lie and taught us how to repress Painful, hurtful disappointment for fear our confession will be negative. Wow. Right out of the pit of hell. Tell the truth in the presence of the one who loves you in spite of your brokenness. He can handle your stuff. Amen. Jeremiah says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Why? Because there's stuff hidden in the shadows of your heart that are hurting you. And he's got to turn the light on and shove it up into your conscious mind so you can stop running away from it. Your conscious mind allows only what you want to look at. But most of your deep processing goes on in your unconscious. In the shadows. It's where your deep fears hide. It's where your unresolved issues hide. 
It's where your mismanaged expectations hide. It's where your masks originate. It's where your metaphors rule. I have over $10,000, $10,000. I have over 10,000 hours I have over 10,000 hours of professional certified coaching that I've done. Once I got my 128 credit hours in coaching and I began to practice as a coach 15 years ago and I've got my board certification now which is the highest level you can get. I've coached over 10,000 hours, people from all over the world from every walk of life. I'm going to tell you one story. Because all of us live in metaphor, we just don't know it. And the more metaphors govern your life. It is not what's in your conscious mind that's in control, it's what's in your heart. What the Bible calls the heart, I'm going to suggest psychologists call the unconscious. And the only reason it's unconscious is because you're not thinking about it. I'll show you how the unconscious works. Think of your left foot. Now, until I said your left foot, you just know it's part of your body, but you weren't thinking about your left foot, were you? Unless it's broken and it's hurting. So what's unconscious is simply what you're not aware of at this moment, but you are really adept at burying stuff there that you don't want to look at. And the mind has an amazing ability to hide things because the heart doesn't want to face it, but the heart knows its own bitterness. The heart knows its own bitterness. I had an alpha male corporate executive leader, CEO of a corporation. And uh, he had high stress. For all the money he had, he wasn't happy. Owned a business, very wealthy, probably on the verge of a major heart attack. And I said, what do you want to talk about? And um, see, when you're dealing with an alpha male, you can't coach like you do other people. You've got to get right in their face and ask them tough questions. So he didn't want to tell me. So I said, what kind of flowers do you like? Now, I'm being very careful. I'm not telling you a literal everything because I want to be very careful about client confidentiality. What kind of flowers do you like? Dr. Sharona, what the hell do flowers have to do with the coaching session? J -j -j just tell me what kind of flower. I I'm sorry, those of you that are on the left coast that can't handle that word. I'm a New Yorker. I say it frequently. I, I need to know what kind of flowers you like. That's a stupid question. Uh, no, sir, it's not a stupid question. Why do you want to know what kind of flowers I like? Because if you don't change your behavior, I want to make sure that what I send to your funeral. <laughs> is something you really want. He said, oh. At which point I said, tell me about your office environment. He said, here's his metaphor. Listen carefully. Out of the abundance of the heart. See, I'm, I'm sending a bucket by my question down into his well. I want to see what water of life in him is in that bucket and I'm gonna by the question draw out of him what's in yeah. his deep heart that he doesn't even know is there that's oh. governing his conscious life and sabotaging his want to causing him to have lost his vision so that he can't see anything clearly what's your office it's a war zone. It's a war zone. He, in those four words, 
He just gave me the Encyclopedia Britannica. He just doesn't know what he just said. But his heart just revealed volumes. I said, so what's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? He said, I get in the shower. I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. He said, you're not in my house. I said, let me ask you the first question again. What's, what is your office environment like? It's a war zone. I said, now let me ask you the second question. What is the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? I get in the shower. No, you prepare for war. And then you get in the shower. And then what do you do? I get dressed. What do you put on? I put on my suit. I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. He said, you've not been in my closet. I put on my suit. I said, you do not put on your suit, and I don't need to go in your closet to prove it. He said, what do I put on? You put on your camos. He says, I don't have camos. Yes, you do, because you are going to a war zone. You put on your camos. I said, and you don't put on a belt. You put on a few grenades and bullets. And you go packing with a pistol and a rifle and a backpack for your munitions. And you don't have companions that are working for you. You have enemies that are your opponents in your own business. And you spend all day battling because you're in a war zone. How's that working for you? Because he needed a mirror to know who he was. Because you can't know yourself by yourself. And we begin to unpack the metaphor so that his conscious mind could grasp this is where I live at an unconscious level. And unless the metaphor changes, my life doesn't change. The renewing of the mind isn't you memorizing enough Bible verses to quote it back to the devil. It is a process that brings you to a place of metamorphosis yes. that requires unpacking yeah. by the spirit yeah. the deeply held assumptions and models of the way you think the world works that doesn't work that way because you don't realize how much you've been seduced by the lies of this age that have governed you at an unconscious level and you can quote all the scripture you want and be as unstable as water. Come on. Amen. First thing Jesus does is he takes the man by the hand. Man can't see him. So what's Jesus doing? He's making contact by touch. This is a touch. This is tactile. This is kinesthetic. He's taking the man by the hand. The man can't see him. All he knows is he can, and Jesus has a way with his touch of communicating safety. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Come on. He has a way by his touch of communicating security. Yes. Why? Because he is salvation. Amen. He doesn't give salvation. He is salvation. He has a way of communicating, I can see you. Yeah. Because he's going to be the man's mirror. And the first thing he does is remove him from the context where he lost his want to because he lost his vision. He's going to put distance between him and everything that caused him to lose his want to. So now Jesus isn't just touching him. He's speaking to him. So he can hear his voice and he's guiding him away from where he lost everything that mattered. Are you breathing? 
Do you realize what Jesus is doing? The healing has already begun. You can have a seat. But I may get you back up in a minute. See, I was raised in the generation of the who. The rock opera Tommy. Tommy, can you hear me? Tommy, can you see me? That deaf, dumb, and blind kid sure plays a mean pinball. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. See me, feel me, touch me, heal me. That's the cry. I can't see, and it makes me feel like I can't be seen. I'm invisible. Do you know how many people in our culture suffer either from invisibility because they've been marginalized or the fear that they're invisible and no one can see them for who they are? Here's a man who lost everything and went through all the internal processes of isolation and trauma and a loss of identity. And Jesus, by a touch, doesn't take much. The touch of the master's hand. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about him. He touches him. He fastens. That word touch means he fastened himself to him. He holds on and he's never going to let go. And by that grasp, he leads and guides him out of the context that took away his want to. And when he gets him far enough away, that is one cute kid. <laughs> He's going to preach. <laughs> when he gets him far enough away, He's about to invade his internal environment without even going inside him. See, because in that day, now the man can't see, but he can hear. In that day, the culture believed that a person's spit had healing properties. So Jesus is meeting the man at the level of his cultural expectations. It says Jesus made spit, but what's he doing to do that? <laughs> now that may sound gross to you, but the man could hear he's about to spit. What's he doing? What is Jesus doing by that one act? He's not trying to be gross. He is communicating to a hearing ear. I know the way you think. You think spit is what's going to heal you. So I'm going to start there at the level of the way you think. So I'm going to meet you in your world and start at the level of what you have faith for. So I'm going to spit and then I'm going to lay hands on your eyes after I spit into them because I want to meet you where you are. Are you listening? This is not, I can't do this in one shot. Jesus has done a whole lot in one shot. This is, this is a process he's taking a man through to get to the core of his unfinished business. And that takes time. 
And so Jesus does all that and says, do you see anything possibly? What's he doing? He's drawing the man out of his isolation, meeting him where he is, and checking to see, did any of that make a difference? This is not about whether Jesus can heal him at once. This is about Jesus getting ready to reorganize the man's metaphors. He's getting to what's hidden in the man's heart because we all live by metaphor. He's gotten into the man's war zone. And Jesus says, do you see anything at all? And it says, which means the man is scanning. But while he's scanning, it goes on to say he looked up. Now he's looking at the face of Jesus, but he's not quite sure. Because if he sees men as trees walking, it means even though Jesus is close, he sees the vague shadow of a face, but he knows at least there's one face he can focus on. So he's looking out, but now he's looking up. And he says, I do see, but what I see is human beings as trees walking about. Now that's not a bad place to start. Why? Because Psalm 1 tells us that the righteous are like trees planted by rivers of living water. See, and the person he's standing in front of is the tree of life himself. And the righteous, according to Psalm 93, will flourish like the palm trees. So now... Palm trees, where are they from? Oh, those are from the mosaic journey in the wilderness. Well, what about the tabernacle? Those are acacia trees. What about David's kingdom? Those are cedars. What about the Garden of Eden? Human beings and trees were planted in the same garden. And man was invited to be tested at a tree. See, we, we, we need to learn how to read the Bible faithfully right. and connect the dots. How many remember playing connect the dots in a coloring book as a kid? We don't know how to connect the dots, which is why we mess up the Bible and come up with all sorts of strange things because we don't go from first mention to last mention and really rightly divide the word of truth. Right. This is an amazing Amen. book if we trust it. That's right. See, in David's kingdom was a kingdom built on cedar trees because his palace was made of cedar so the davidic kingdom was all tied to the cedar tree so when the son of david comes bless god he's a military conqueror no 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 no. cedar trees were for a thousand years ago mustard trees are for now they were offended because a mustard tree is a small despicable bush not to be compared with a cedar he is shattering their expectations of a military political leader because the son of David is nothing like the bloodthirsty David. He will shed his own blood, but he won't shed anybody else's. So for Jesus, it's a mustard tree. But it's also a fig tree. And in the exile... Post Babylon, post exile, second temple, it was mulberry trees. We could spend three hours on all those trees and how they relate to revival. And the stages of revival. But we haven't got time. So when the man says, I see men as trees walking about. Number one, he has forgotten what human beings look like, and he's comparing them to trees, which is not good. But he's also starting to see from a biblical worldview that men and women are supposed to be those that are planted in the ground, but their branches reach up to heaven. Because the outline of a tree is the same as the outline of the glory cloud 
that sat over the tabernacle and the temple and over Mary. So every time you see a tree, think the glory cloud because the outline of it is that which reaches into the heavenly dimension and becomes a resting place for angelic visitation and for possibility and for promise because the roots are on earth, but the branches touch heaven. I see human beings like trees. On the one hand, you need to get healed of that. On the other hand, that's where you start seeing who we are. You're going to get it all back, but you got to see at the level of a metaphor how God built us and why the symbolic world is the real world. This is not about Jesus didn't have enough power. This is about, do you realize when we, when we say that, I want to say, do you realize who this is? This is not some, let's see if this works and let's try it out. This is the God man. This is Yahweh in the flesh. This is I am that I am. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's the wonderful counselor. Don't turn in this in, into a formula for how to heal people. We don't need another formula. We need Jesus. We are addicted to how-tos in our culture in America. Jesus didn't give how-tos. He gave himself. And there was silence in San Diego. You think about it. Think about how many how-to sermons are preached in this nation. Yeah. It's not about how-tos. Techniques are Greek. They're not Bible. Techniques are tied to Aristotle and Plato, not to Jesus. The Greeks were technicians. Jesus wasn't a tech. Faith is not a technique. It's the one thing I wish if we could bring Norman Grubb back to life, he would have changed that phrase when he wrote the book on faith because he called it a technique. And I want to say, Norman, you were brilliant in so many ways. You wrote Reese Howell's Intercessor, your father-in-law C.T. Studd, your ministry in the Congo, the, the, the things God used. But then when you got older, you turned faith into a technique and you misrepresented what the scripture says about faith. Turned it into a formula. As brilliant as your insights are in that book, when you called faith a technique, you dishonored the Christ who is the author and finisher of faith. Faith is not a technique. It's not a formula. It's not mental assent. You can't even get faith. Stop trying to get something you were never supposed to get. Faith comes. When does faith come? When he comes. Are you listening? Because we all know him by interpretation. You don't know Christ any other way than by interpretation. Can I take five minute sidetrack? Tell somebody, you don't know Christ because you got hit and slain in the spirit. That was an experience, but that doesn't, that's not how you know Christ. It's a wonderful experience, but that's not how you know Christ. See, we equate our experiences with knowing Christ. The only way you know Christ is by interpretation. I'm going to take you on a side road and we'll get back. There was that prophecy about two paths. I'm going to take one of them and we're going to meet back in the middle. Remember the road to Emmaus? Cleopas and the unnamed disciple. You know who Cleopas was? Jesus' uncle. Her, his mother's brother. You know who his wife is? His Aunt Mary. She's unnamed and he's named. This is blood relatives. And it's resurrection morning. This is their nephew. 
They don't know who he is. And uh, they're talking. And he gets in the middle of the conversation and says, what are you all talking about? Now, don't you think that if they looked at his beard, they would have seen the little blood marks from Friday? Don't you think if they looked at his hands? The wounds are still there. Last I read, they're still there. Right? They didn't recognize him. Because experience is not how you recognize him. They didn't recognize him because they didn't understand the scriptures. They were hardened in heart. They weren't looking for resurrection in the middle of history, and they weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to be other than a political king. So they didn't see him. He didn't fulfill their expectations. Therefore, they were virtually blind. So how do they come to see him? He starts with Genesis 3.15 and goes through all the scriptures and say it's all about me. He explains the scriptures to them. Right? And he walks seven miles with them. And it gets dark. And they're at home already. And he acts like he's going to go further. But they prevail on him as observant Jews who believe in hospitality. To beg him to come in. It's nighttime. Spend the night. And he comes in and Aunt Mary prepares the table. And when Jesus gets to the table, he doesn't take the seat as a guest. He takes the seat as the host. And there's a loaf of bread and a cup of wine. This is a Jewish home. Might have been Italian, but it was Jewish. <laughs> And Jesus takes the bread. He has already opened up the scriptures along the way. He's been teaching them from the scriptures who Christ is. And he takes the bread and he lifts it up and he blesses it and he breaks it. And it says their eyes were opened. And all of a sudden, the broken loaf drops to the table. And they look at each other and say, it was him. They didn't recognize him in the experience. They recognized him in how he taught them how to interpret the text. They knew him by interpretation. And we're looking for him in an experience, and we marginalize the text. And so he doesn't show up quite the way we want him to because we don't hear him from the text. So hear me. If you want to steward a revival, make sure the text is central to every time you gather that you break the bread of life and don't just, don't just come together to have a miracle. Talk about the miracle worker. Open the book. He's got to open the book and reveal himself through us rightly dividing the text. That's how he shows up. Otherwise, we will be unstable and carry around our unfinished business and look for the next great move and the next big word we're going to get, when we've already gotten 35,000 that we haven't done anything with. I don't need any more prophecies. I need to live the ones out that I got. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, please understand, I, I, I'm all for the move of God. Please understand, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. I love Jeremy and Miranda. I'm trying to tell us something from my perspective, 45 years in the ministry. I've seen the best and the worst. I see where things go when people end up thinking my experience validates. My experience is wonderful. I can encounter Christ, but it's always going to be I know him based on interpretation. To divorce the scripture from the Son of God or the Spirit is to put us in dangerous territory. It is the Father's three-stranded cord that cannot be broken. Never separate the Son from the Scriptures from the Spirit or you will end up in error. Yep. Error is possible. And all of us need to walk carefully so that we don't end up in error. Right. We know Him by interpretation. I see men as trees walking. 
So we've already established, on the one hand, he forgot what human beings look like. But on the other hand, he's discovering from a biblical worldview that human beings are supposed to be trees that are rooted in the earth with branches that reach into the heavens so that the angelic glory that's on Christ as Jacob's ladder can ascend and descend on his body as well, bringing the resources of heaven into the earthly arena through us as his people. All the resources that heaven wants to unload by his spirit within us. So he's bringing him gradually and then it says he laid his hands on him a second time. Not because he couldn't do it once, but because now that he was able to identify what he did see and what he didn't, and he was able to realize, I've isolated myself and I've forgotten what it is to be a human being. And I want to be part of a company. Jesus lays hands on him a second time. And it says he looked intently. He now saw with penetrating gaze into the depths of the human life. And he saw everything clearly because his intentionality, his want to, came. His want to came back and he looked through his intentionality and saw everything clearly and at a distance. And when Jesus says, don't go back to the village, he's not telling him to cut his friends off. He's saying, don't go back into the very thing that caused you to lose your vision in the first place. And he sends him to his home. He sends him to the people that know him best so that he can be regrafted into community from the family that knows him best and loves him most. So it may not be Bethsaida where he's sending him to. He may be sending him back to his roots. This is homecoming. You follow what I'm saying? And it says his sight was restored. So restoration happens when we can come. And for all of us, there's a want to that has been aborted in some area of our life. And for some of us, we feel like, I don't have the strength or the effort at this season in my life to go after it. But are you still breathing? (laughs) If you're still breathing, His promise is still living for you because he wants to give you the want to so that you can have the vision to see the how to so that you can recognize the chance to when it shows up. If you would like the Lord to do some surgery tonight on your misplaced metaphor, and you'd like to identify where your metaphors are that are blinding your vision. I'm not asking you to go look for them. I'm asking you to let his light shine. In the Anglican church, there is, would be right here, what they call the chancel rail. How many of you have ever been in an Anglican church or a Catholic church or a Lutheran church? How many of you know what the chancel rail looks like? It's a rail that goes across the entire area from where the lectern and the organ and the choir is. Do you know what the chancel rail is there for? See, we demonize anything that we think is religious. 
But you know, the word religion is not a dirty word, even though charismatics demonize it. There is a theology that's present in cathedrals and buildings that charismatics care nothing about. You know what the chancel rail is, theologically, and why it's there? Just imagine there's a gold rail here. Now, we get a portion of it right, but we don't have a rail. And when the preacher preaches, or the, or, you know, the Anglican priest, they get behind the rail because they're preaching from behind the rail. Why? Because the rail is the dividing line between heaven and earth. And the cloud of witnesses and the angelic hosts, all nine levels of the hierarchy of angels, are in the cloud and are behind the chancel rail. And when the priest, the pastor, the bishop preaches, he or she preaches as the representative of Christ in heaven. So that what people are hearing is not the words of a mere human being, but the words of Christ when they're faithful to the text. And so when the altar call is given, the congregation symbolically is coming as close to the thin line between heaven and earth as possible because all of heaven's resources, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, are going to lean over the rail and pour out <laughs> the necessary resources to bring them to the place of healing and deliverance. We at least get the altar right. I'm not saying put a chancel rail in here. That's not what I'm saying. But I have often in our house walked the line where a chancel rail would be. And I'll say to the saints, as a Pentecostal, I understand that the altar is where we get altered because heaven leans over the rail and resources are given when we get to the altar. It doesn't pay to have church if you're not going to be altered. And you can't be altered unless there's an altar to come to where you can get altered by an encounter with heaven. And so I'll do this. I'll go to the end of the auditorium and the platform, and I'll walk. I've been doing this a lot lately. And my folk now know Bishop's walking the rail. He's walking the fine line between heaven and earth. And they know what's going to happen when I get to the other end. Because when I get to the other end, I'm going to step back behind the rail on behalf of Christ and let the people know if they meet me there, he's going to meet them there. So it all depends on what you want tonight. Because I just showed you where the dividing line is. And all of heaven is coming to lean over the rail. C, D minor 7, E minor 7 in an escalating pattern. Well, do I need to show you what that is? You sure? Back down to D minor. Back down to C. We're ascending and descending musically, intentionally, in the major key. Because heaven rarely sings in the minor, by the way. Heaven always sings in the major key because heaven lifts our spirits. Soaking is done in the minor key, but deliverance happens in the major key. Haven't got time to go there. That's a whole separate message on modalities and worship. Take you back to church history and show you the modalities where the angels join us as we sing. See, I've been listening to your music. Most of it is in the minor mode. And that's fine. I just need you to know the minor mode will only get you so far musically. So if you want this revival to go to another level, you need to learn all the other modalities and start singing some songs that take you on an ascent and not merely an introspective descent into 
That's all good, but it's not all there is. My, my undergraduate degree is in music. I was a praise and worship leader before I was a preacher. It was as a psalmist that I learned how to prophesy. So I'm just trying to make you aware that there are dimensions of worship that you haven't even tapped into yet. Can you hear that? And what you're hearing right now is a very simple ascending pattern. Actually, you hold the mic and I'm going to sit there and do some stuff. Just, this will be an on-the-job mentoring moment. Teach me your ways. Give me a string on there as well as a grand. I've got a grand. I want a string as well. You know how to get me a string? I want you to just think about right now that one area just don't focus on everything because some of you have decided to go down memory lane and pull up all sorts of stuff thinking you're gonna have, have to have radical surgery everything Jesus does is takes time nothing's gonna get solved in one night at an altar you're on a journey but there's probably one area right now where for you if you would just trust God with it, something's going to loosen up at this altar and your want to is going to revive. So I want you to take a moment and in your heart of hearts, I want you to get in touch with where that area is and just bring it to speech before God. And in bringing it to speech, be honest about your disappointments. Be honest about the areas where you feel like you know, I believe for this at one time, but it just hasn't worked out. And um, Father, I, I just need to talk to you about this. So would you do that? I'm going to sing, and you go ahead and do that. What was lost in battle? What was taken unlawful where the enemy has scattered your seed and where strength is failing where health is ailing I'll restore to you All of this and more I'll restore to you All of this and more What was lost Just talk to him In battle what was taken unlawful where the enemy has scattered your seed and where strength is ailing where health is failing I'll restore to you all of this and more I'll restore to you all of this and more
of this and more. Oh, I'll restore. I'll restore. I'll restore to you all of this and more I'll restore to you I'll do more for you I will wipe away all the bitter tears I will make up for all the lonely years I'll restore to you All of this and more I'll restore to you Child I'll do more for you I'll restore to you All of this and more You're my child You're the one that I died for my child I'm your wide and open door I'll amaze you I'll amaze you I'll amaze you with all of this more I'll restore to you all of this and more just talk to him saints touch those areas there are a number of people that have been battling a deep-seated frustration that you've just learned to live with and it's become a low-grade anger you just live with it you hide it well but it's frustration which is low-grade anger and it's wearing away at you and you've had a hard time admitting that you battle bouts of despair for all that you're seeing God doing, you really feel like you're invisible because this frustration is just there and you don't know how to shake it. And he's wanting you to own it in his presence and not run away from it, not be afraid of it. You're afraid if you look at it, it's going to get worse. It's not going to get worse. You're going to bring it to the light and it's going to lose its power can't be afraid to look at the dark stuff that's hiding in the shadows if you bring it to the light it'll become light and you're gonna get raised out of dead things but I know in my spirit there are a number of people battling low-grade frustration and it's leading to bouts of despair and if that's where you are right now I don't want you to be embarrassed I just want you to raise your hand and say Bishop that's me I, I, I need some help in that area and those of you that are around them, just gently lay hands on them. Just gently lay hands on them. And just ask the Lord to just minister to them right now because He comes. He's here. He's here in His healing grace. He's here in His healing mercy. I'll restore. I'll restore
I'll restore to you all of this and more. I'll restore. I'll restore. I'll restore to you all of this and more. He's here. I'll restore to you all of this and more. Oh, we bless you, Father. We magnify your name. We glorify your name. My precious young sister, there has been a sorrow that you have carried that isn't yours alone. This sorrow exists in your family system. And it's not just in you, you have experienced it as you've carried even the pain of your mom. And it's affected the whole family because everything is constellated around the sorrow. But the Lord Jesus is going to heal the sorrow. And as I touch you, I want you to know the whole family is going to be touched. Mama has carried a pain that goes back decades. And it's impacted the outlook of the house. But tonight, I want you to know Jesus comes to bring reassurance and well-being there has been a dark cloak that has sat on you oh my from your earliest remembrance this darkness has tried to take away your joy i can go all the way back to when you were three and four years old right now as i stand here in the presence of the lord and I can see this thing trying to cloak itself on you and suffocate you. There have been encounters in your sleep that have given you deep anxiety, trauma. But tonight the healer comes to touch the deep place in your heart and to eliminate this question because you've blamed yourself for the pain because all a child can do is say, what did I do that was wrong, that created this? And the enemy has used that to convince you that you're the problem. You're not. He comes with healing grace, fresh oil fresh oil there's actually even been physical pains that are tied to the emotional stress I'm feeling things in my chest and in my abdomen how long has this been going on as long as you can remember now he heals you the tightness in the chest the spasms in the abdomen by the time you wake up tomorrow morning everything's gonna change as the hand of the Lord comes He's moving right now. He heals you. You're on a healing journey. Over the next number of weeks, your tears are going to change. What were once tears of despair are going to become tears of joy as the cathartic, cleansing presence of the Spirit unleashes and unlocks the hope of a sure future for you. The enemy has come on more than one occasions and told you you have no future. 
The devil is a lie. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the almighty Son of God, liberation is yours. Freedom is yours. God is loosing the band of infirmity. And it has been a spirit of infirmity. It's overshadowed you like a cloak. It's taken away your strength. But it goes now in the name of Jesus. Father, I bless what you're doing. I bless what you're doing. Mm. I bless what you're doing. Father, I thank you right now. Ah, the night terrors are going to stop. They're just disappearing like vapor. These shades are no longer going to show up. They're gone. They're gone. Father, I bless what you're doing. Father, I bless what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. I thank you for your care, your tenderness. I want to pray for a number of you that are battling not just low-grade frustration, but with that cycles of anxiety where are you I don't want you to line up all of you that are battling low grade frustration with cycles of anxiety just come over on this side of the room and line up and I just want you to trust that that the Lord himself is doing something fresh I think a lot of times we 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 miss moments because we're expecting it to happen one way and it sometimes happens in quite the opposite of the way we expect it to happen let your expectation be of him not of how you think it's supposed to happen he won't disappoint you um what's your name your name son Nathaniel, come here, Nathaniel. Stand over here. How old are you? How long have you been battling insomnia? the cycle passed or you st okay um, and on a scale of one to ten where's the anxiety now if zero is no anxiety and ten is like off the charts where is it now so it's still above the midline okay um, how much of this is tied to the occupational piece work Okay. Um, just lift your hands. Father, I thank you for Nathaniel. I thank you that you love him with an everlasting love. And that you're relentless in your love for him. I thank you, Lord, for his sensitivities to you, to your heart. And Father, I thank you that your hand is on his life. And Father, I pray that in this season, that at a very profound level, 
he would know with assurance that it shall be well. Now, my brother, while I've got my hand on your shoulder, I sense virtue coming out of my hand, which means the Lord wants to minister to you physically as well as emotionally. Because your body is holding a great deal of tension. The minute I laid hands on you, I felt all the tension is being held in your body and it's concentrated in the upper torso. And there's a sense in which you're not sure how to let go of it. But God is loosening this thing up right now. And His healing grace from within is rising up. There, there are hidden fears that seek to rob you of the rest that is your portion in Jesus. And I want you to hear me. He is relentless in his love for you. Relentless in his love for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, him who is and was and is about to arrive, the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of nothing missing, nothing broken, the one through whom our peace is given because the chastisement for our peace fell upon him. I pray now that because of the cross that there would be a lifting of the anxiety. As we behold what you did at Calvary, we now allow a releasing of holding on to the chastisement. There is a deep, I'm not good enough belief system that wants to take your joy. And the Lord is bringing healing to you in this season. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I bless you. I bless you that you're a healer. That you're a healer. Thank you, Father. All of you that are battling what we've been talking about, just lift your hands right now. I want to just touch you. I want you to receive as I just lay hands on you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive. In the name of the Lord Jesus, receive. Man, oh man, my brother, what's your name? Peter. Peter, it's a great name. Um, there's a lot of energy you're just an energetic person but there is were you here this afternoon okay I urge you to get if they recorded it but there is within you a determination to prove your legitimacy and um, the Lord wants to deliver you from any need to prove your legitimacy it's really okay to be you. But I said this afternoon, one of my dearest friends is MC Hammer. And years ago, he did a rap song called Too Legit to Quit. And your namesake, the Apostle Peter, was impulsive. He was always trying to validate his existence and prove he was legitimate. The Lord had to bring him through a process to cause him to rest in the fact that he was seen and understood. And he really was given keys. Um, you're gifted. You're incredibly gifted. Sometimes we can feel like we've got to prove who we are. 
and God allows us to go through seasons where we knock ourselves out doing that but what attracts him to us is our weakness and um, the hand of God is on you for purpose I promise he's not looking for you to be perfect he's perfecting you in your weakness and it's really okay for you to be you and he's going to make you far more comfortable in the skin you're in than you realize in this next season can you hear that lift your hands father i thank you for my brother i thank you for his zeal for his passion for his hunger for the gifting and capacity that he carries. And I thank you for the ease and rest of grace that brings him into all things without effort. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in his life. Thank you for where you're taking him. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, touch, Lord, right now. Touch, right now. Touch, right now. Touch, right now. Touch, right now. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I thank you that everything will dissolve into peace. We let go as best we know how. We let go as best we know how. As best we know how, we release as best we know how. Father, as I lay hands, I thank you that you also move through the laying on of hands. In the name of the Lord Jesus, the Almighty Son of God, I bless what you're doing. I bless what you're doing. I bless what you're doing. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that it shall be well. It shall be well. My dear sister, the Lord's touching your circulation right now, not just the anxiety, but your circulation. The life is in the blood. I sow the word of God into your bloodstream from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. The tingling in the arms and the legs is going to improve. It's going to, how long has this been going on? Almost two, years. Almost two years. In the name of Jesus, the virtue of the Son of God, it's your portion from the inside out. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's his presence. It's just, it's like liquid oil. It's wonderful. More, Lord. It's him. It's him. It's him. The shooting pain in the right leg is going to go away. You're going to wake up tomorrow morning. No shooting pain in the right leg. How long has that been going on? How long has that been going on? Almost two years. Almost two years, too. No more. Tomorrow is a new day. In the name of Jesus. Father, we bless you. Lord, I thank you right now for your healing presence, your healing grace. We receive, we receive, we receive, we receive, we receive. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. You're very creative, you're very gifted. And it's not because of all the tats. It's because of what you are inside. And um, there was a part of your story that you kind of felt like, I can't reconcile this. I wish it wasn't there. 
But you know, the Lord has a way of taking the parts of our story that we wish we weren't there and turning them into his story. God's going to use your story in a very significant way. And um, he's up to something good. And uh, he's going to release you from a few strongholds that have kept you in a place of less than optimal living. And the, um, the unmet need that has driven some of the behaviors that... I want you to look at me for a minute. So, you're looking at somebody that started smoking when he was 12 years old. By the time I was 18, I was smoking two or three packs a day. Does this relate? Can you relate to any of what I'm telling you right now? Okay. I woke up one morning spitting up phlegm, scared to death because I wanted to sing and I felt like I killed my lungs. It was a few weeks before I met the Lord and God just lifted the urge. But the cigarette was meeting a need. It was meeting a very deep need and I, it was immediately met by me going to the cigarette because I didn't know how to process two things, fear and rejection. Am I talking to you? Okay. And some of this stuff goes back and is part of your story all the way back to the beginning. But my dear sister, you are loved by Jesus. He doesn't do anything in your life except because he loves you. Stop trying to quit smoking. Say, preacher, what are you telling me? I'm telling you, stop trying to quit smoking. Now they're thinking, Bishop, you better clean this up. <laughs> I'm telling you the reason you haven't stopped is because you're trying to quit. You need a much more worthwhile dream than quitting smoking. What do you want to gain at this season of your life that you don't have? Just having more of his presence. Okay, for what purpose? Just being able to worship in spirit. For what purpose? Help others. For what purpose? I'm taking you on a journey. <laughs> um, just deeper love. For what purpose? What will that do for you? Change my attitudes. Which attitude? Just having more like positivity, like positive outlook. Here we go. We're getting to the metaphors now. So having more positivity, which tells me what's underneath having more positivity. It's not there, is it? What's there? It's negativity. About? Who I am. Who you are. See, all the smoking is is the fruit of the tree. The root of this is who you see yourself as. And guess what? None of us is perfect. And there were demands unconsciously and consciously placed on you to be perfect growing up, weren't there? And uh, you're not a slouch. You're pretty smart. But you never measured up. And you learned self-hatred at a very young age. All the smoking is is a way to escape hating yourself. Jesus is taking you on a journey from self-hatred to self-acceptance. So I don't want you to quit smoking. It's not a good enough goal. I want you to make your dream to let go of anything that is less than self-acceptance. Christ accepted you. How about you accept you? When is it going to be... What's your name, sweetheart? Sean. Sean. When is it going to be okay for Sean to be Sean? Tell me when. 
Hopefully right now. Okay, so, I mean, okay, so, or, I mean, do we need to put it out just a few days in the future so that we have a little bit of time for process? Okay, so, watch. Okay, so, can, can I take you all on a journey through her? Because if you need healing, watch what gets ready to happen. Come on, come on up here. Okay, so, here we are. Just watch this. I'm going to take you through a process. Is that okay? And then we're going to be done. Because if I touch the one, I'll touch the many. Okay? Okay. So we're going to stand here. How old are you now? Can I ask? Yeah, 31. 31. Okay. Your birthday? June 22nd. June 22nd. 1987. 1987. Okay. This is June 22nd, 1980. Let's, let's go back here. This is June 22nd, 1987. Lean against the wall. Okay? Now, on the other end of the wall, this is June 22nd. We're going to look back at that day. This is June 22nd, 219. How old are you going to be on June 22nd, 219? 32. 32. Okay. There's 32 years between here and there. Okay. As you look back, 32, come on, let's go back, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We just went back. Well, we went all the way forward. We went into the future because Jesus is already at your birthday in 219. He's already there celebrating your birthday. And on your birthday, you're not going to be smoking. You're not. Because he's calling you from the future to the future. So let's go back. Now, how old were you when you started smoking? Twelve, 12 years old. Stop. We're right here. It's 12 years old. Remember when that happened? Okay, close your eyes. I want you to remember the exact moment. Close your eyes. When you started smoking. Are you there? Okay. Now, I want you to forget the moment in terms of time and focus in on what you were feeling. And let me know, keep your eyes closed, let me know when you touch the feeling of why you took that cigarette. Keep your eyes closed. I want you to put your hand on the part of your body where you feel it the strongest. Now hold your hand there and remember just the feeling. Okay, you trust me? Okay, I'm gonna take you through a process. And, and what I'd like you to do is just stay in 12 year old mode, remember where you were, and this is tied to a relationship, isn't it? Close your eyes. Miranda, would you come and just lay your hand on her hand? Just place your hand on her hand, at a girl. Um, this is tied to a relationship. This met a need, the smoking, didn't it? Okay. I want you to fill in the blank in, in terms of this feeling because when you first felt the feeling, tears came to your eyes and I want you to stay there. I don't want to rescue you from the pain because in that pain there's a gift and Jesus is going to unlock it for you. Okay. I want you to fill in the blank from that feeling at 12 years old. I need to fit in. To fit in. I need to fit in. Okay. People are stay in that feeling. People are it's okay. not understanding. People are not understanding. And when people are not understanding, I feel left. Left. Keep your eyes closed. And when I feel left, what I usually do is smoke. Smoke. 
And when I smoke, it makes me feel better. better. So now, we've got that, right? Let's lock that in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're aware of where the pain started. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to heal this for Sean tonight. All right, you ready? Take a walk with me. Okay. People are not understanding, right? And when they're not, I feel left or left out. I need to fit in. And when I don't, I smoke because it makes me feel better. Right? It's your birthday. 219, it's your birthday. You're not smoking anymore. You're free from people are not understanding because it's their problem, not yours. You're free from I feel left out because you're not. You got family. I need to fit in. You already do fit in. Smoking no longer meets that need. I don't even like the taste of the cigarettes anymore. It's your birthday. Close your eyes. It's your birthday. It's June 22nd, 219, right? Put your hand on your heart and try to find all that stuff that was in the 12-year-old Sean. It's not there. It's not there. But don't forget, this is the... Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't... It's not, this is June 22nd, 219. Y'all are jumping the gun. This is your birthday in the future. We're not there yet. Let's go back to when you were 12. I'm going to put all that bad stuff back on you. Can I do that? Yes. You should have said no. But. <laughs> but it was gone when we got there, wasn't it? Okay. Let's go back to that moment. Right there, 12 years old. Close your eyes. I want you to look at that person because it's a specific person, isn't it? And it's an important person in your life, isn't it? It's one of your parents, isn't it? Yeah. And the relationship never did get healed, did it? Okay. Okay. Close your eyes. I want you to realize that it's not people, it's a person. And it's a person that means a lot to you, but you feel like you don't mean a lot to them. But remember what I said tonight, keep your eyes closed. Remember what I said tonight, you can't give what you don't have. It's your dad, it's your mom. She couldn't give it to you because of her own pain. You probably know that by now. So I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to just see her in front of you at 12 years old. But realize you're 31 now and you, you're very aware that her own brokenness has devastated her. And she can only give what she has, but the healing she needs, you're receiving. The relationship's going to change, Sean because you're changing. But I want you at 12 years old to give her permission to be her without you feeling like it has to reflect back on you. Just do that inside. However you want to do that in the presence of the Lord, just do that. Let me know when that's done. Okay? Now step out of that space. Okay, we're going to step back in now in a minute, but I want you to just clear your heart and mind and because you probably feel a weight has lifted, yes? Okay, let's go back to when you were 12. Close your eyes, put your hand over your heart. Find the feeling that made you want the cigarette. Got it? On a scale of one to ten, where is it now? Not too bad. Mac, what's not too bad? Two. Two. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to your birthday. Come on. <laughs> Let's.
Let's look back at that 12-year-old girl. She's standing right there. What does the Sean at 32 know that the Sean at 12 doesn't know? That it's okay. What's okay? Oh, that my mom loves me. And she just doesn't know how to show it sometimes. Wow. Wow. What would you tell her? Be nice to her. Wow. Wow. Is it okay to be nice to her? Yeah. Okay. Now, should we go back one more time and check? Come on. <laughs> Okay, just go back on the timeline, 12 years old. Put your hand on your heart. Let's go back and get in touch with the need for a cigarette. Is it there? At all? No. It's gone. Do we have to wait for your birthday to throw out the cigarettes? No. You have any in your pocket? No. You have any at home? No. In the car. Go get them. We're going to lay them on the altar. We're going to lay him on the altar. You're not going to need him anymore. Is that okay? Is it the car park like far away? Yeah. Oh, don't get him. <laughs> Bring him tomorrow night. You're going to come tomorrow night? Yeah. You're going to lay him at the altar. You're going to have an early birthday celebration for Sean. <laughs> She's going to bring him to the altar tomorrow night. God wants to unlock us from the inside out in all sorts of ways that we don't always have patience for. And some stuff is quick, but it takes time. Jesus had to touch the man twice for a reason. He's the wonderful counselor. He does all things well. God has given Jeremy and Miranda a stewardship of a movement. You're here because you're part of that movement. There's something in you that resonates with what's in them. There's a deposit of grace in them for you. There's something you know calls to you every time they minister to you. And there's something you know that a missing piece is given because they're in your life. It's not just the gift, they're the gift. Does that make sense? In other words, it's not it, apostolic, prophetic, function, all of those things. The person doesn't have the gift, the person is the gift. Those are the Doma gifts. The ascension gifts are the persons themselves. God shapes the whole of their life to give them to the church as gifts. And you wouldn't have made it three years unless that gift was present and residing in them. And you've grown and you've been benefited and you've been blessed. And you guys have been blessed by some of the greatest voices in the kingdom. You know, and, and then, you, then they bring the loudmouth Italian in and just messes it all up. But in your generation, you need to realize that some of the finest kingdom voices grace this gathering. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God values what he placed in Jeremy and Miranda for your sake. So I want us to do something tonight. As a, Listen, it's conference. It's third year anniversary. And I'm going to ask some of you to join me and stretch a little bit. I'm going to ask you to join me in sowing a $100 seed into the soil of the Elisha Revolution. You don't have a hundred, come as close as you can. But if you do have a hundred, and even if you feel like it's a sacrifice, just join me in sowing that seed, because I'm going to sow a hundred dollars tonight, because I just want to be part of the harvest that's coming in this region because of what God is doing in this ministry. I want everybody to get something significant and prepare to honor God in our worship. Let's get ready to give. Come on. Yeah, you can bring it to me. 
The ushers have envelopes. For those of you that need an envelope, raise your hands. You can also give online. Those of you that are watching by way of live stream, there's a secure server right there. You can give. You can give by app. Those of us that are not natives of the millennial generation, we still give by cash and check because we're immigrants. The natives know how to use apps and stuff. I still write my checks at home, and I'm a fossil. Um, I do give. It just takes me longer than the millennials. They do it right away. But... Um, if you need an envelope, raise your hands. Would you welcome Jeremy as he comes? Wow, can we give Jesus a big hand? Listen, you guys, we got a whack load of cake out in the back. And so after you guys are done giving tonight, listen, we're going to have a little celebration party in the back foyer there. And, uh, you know, whoever wants some cake can eat the cake. Unfortunately, it's not vegan and gluten-free, but I'll eat Miranda's piece for her. And, uh, you know, she's probably got a bar or something in her bag that she can, I mean, listen, she's got all these bars, you know, that they, they have a flavor it's like, you know, cinnamon apple, and then you eat it, and it tastes like tree bark. But you know what? It's, she enjoys those. So maybe she have one of those. And, and, but anyway, who wants some cake as well? But listen, you guys, we're so thankful. Thank you, Bishop, for everything that you brought today. Give uh, Bishop a, a big hand. And, uh, you know, I'm excited because uh, earlier today, both in the service as well as when we were hanging out, you know, in the car coming back from lunch, uh, Bishop said, we need to come back and do a school and, and training, you know, and, and so listen, I, I, my mom, she's right over there. She didn't raise no fool. I'm like, yes, let's do that. And uh, anybody would love to do that? Yeah, come on. So uh, listen, we'll, we'll just ask Holy Ghost to speak to him. And, and uh, you know, when, when we can do that, you know, maybe next year we'll do it. Amen. Well, listen, bless you guys. Go get some cake. Now, don't, don't be putting it in your neighbor's face. Come on. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you guys go ahead and put the buckets up front. And, uh, uh, whew, you know, whenever you're ready, you can give. And those of you watching online, you can give as well. <laughs> Music, please. <laughs> 